about four months ago, I took a lab class here at MIT. And uh, there I learned how to synthesize, uh, separate, and purify compounds. But most importantly, I learned how to analyze them. A reality a young chemist might not face until they reach the lab is that compounds are never completely pure, especially the ones they make. You know, you can't simply look at a glass vial and say that you made ethanol. And even if you could see, smell, or somehow indicate that you've made your compound, you still couldn't say how pure it is. The only way to truly identify your compound is to use computational power. The instrument within the lab that can powerfully identify your compound is the nuclear magnetic resonance spectrometer. Unfortunately, NMR spectroscopy is intricate and I had trouble finding resources for learning about it. My name is Austin Clark. I study chemical engineering at MIT, and I'm going to describe nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. NMR spectroscopy helps identify a compound by displaying information about the bonds within the compound. Running a proton NMR means that you'll have the machine interact with the hydrogen atoms in your compound to identify the bonds hydrogen atoms make. Similarly, carbon-13 NMR helps identify bonds made by carbon. Since every compound has a unique set of bonds, every compound has a unique NMR spectrum, graph showing those bonds. You can think of the NMR spectrum as a barcode to the compound, uh, like the barcode for a product in a grocery store. If we can run an NMR spectrum on our sample, we should be able to obtain this barcode and identify this compound. To understand how the NMR works and what its data means, we need to begin at the atom. Within the nucleus of the atom, there are protons and neutrons. Protons and neutrons have an intrinsic property of one-half spin. As the nucleus accumulates these protons and neutrons, these spins cancel in pairs. So if a nucleus has an odd number of protons or neutrons, then it's going to have net spin because there will be an odd proton or neutron without a partner to cancel the spin. Any nucleus that has a spin also has a magnetic dipole moment, like a bar magnet. This is due to a positively charged particle in rotation. Any atom that has a nucleus with this net spin is in theory detectable by NMR. Hydrogen 1 and carbon 13 which make up most bonds and organic compounds, have net spins of one half. So they have this magnetic dipole and can therefore be detected by NMR. Under normal circumstances, nuclei can spin in any direction. However, if you apply a magnetic field, there becomes an energetic preference for the dipoles to align with the magnetic field. If we wanted a nucleus to align against the field, we would have to provide energy. This interaction is similar to the interaction between two magnets. Magnets want to align for stability. In this situation, quantum mechanical theory tells us that these nuclei can take on two states. The lower energy, more stable, upspin state, or the higher energy, less stable, downspin state. The energy between these two states, that is the energy needed to flip a nucleus from the upspin state to the downspin state, is this height differential. This energy gap is directly proportional to the strength of the magnetic field applied. If you increase the field strength, you increase the energy gap. Intuitively, the interaction between two magnets is stronger if you increase the strength of one of them. When these nuclei are under a magnetic field and therefore exist in the up or the down spin state, they also precess, that is their dipole or axis of spin, rotates about the external field direction. This precessional frequency, or the Larmor frequency, is directly proportional to the energy gap between the spin states. So, the larger the energy gap, the faster the nucleus precesses in either the up or down spin state. Once I learned the foundational science, I was ready to proceed. Net spin gives a nucleus a dipole. Under a magnetic field, a nucleus with a dipole 
will precess about the external field direction, either the up or down spin state, depending on whether energy is available. Next, I learned about electron shielding. Under a magnetic field, a nucleus's electrons will create a magnetic field opposing the external field. This slightly cancels the external field, thus resulting in the nucleus feeling a weaker effective field. Since the effective magnetic field is weaker, the energy gap for spin states is smaller. A smaller energy gap means slower precession. When electrons are close to a nucleus, the cancellation is strong, leading to this weaker interaction, a smaller energy gap, a slower precession. When electrons are farther from a nucleus, the cancellation is weak, leading to stronger interaction, a larger energy gap, and a faster precession. Let's analyze the hydrogen atoms of methanol. The electronegativity of oxygen affects the degree to which these hydrogen nuclei can hold on to their electrons. This hydrogen will have its electrons hold on hard, so electrons will be farther from the nucleus and not cancel the field. So the nucleus will feel the full external field, leading to a stronger interaction. These three hydrogen nuclei will not have their electrons hold on as hard, so electrons will be closer to the nucleus and will cancel the external field. So these nuclei will feel a weaker field, leading to weaker interactions. Since the interaction strength between a nucleus and its external field corresponds to an energy gap, and an energy gap corresponds to the precession of the nucleus, this hydrogen nucleus precesses fast, while these three precess slower. So now I understood NMR. If we could read these processional speeds, these Larmor frequencies, we could identify the bonds in a sample because each Larmor frequency is associated with a unique bond. This is what the NMR reads when it interacts with these nuclei. So how does the machine read these frequencies? Let's say we are running a proton NMR on methanol. So we want to identify all of the bonds hydrogen makes within our sample. We've inserted our sample of methanol and the NMR has applied an external magnetic field. Shown are all the hydrogen nuclei precessing in the magnetic field. Each nucleus is either in the up or down spin state and precesses about the external field, which points in the positive z hat direction. Since there's an energetic preference for the dipoles of the nuclei to align with the field, we have a few more nuclei in the up spin state than the down spin state. As a result, the net dipole vector, showing the sum of all dipoles, points in the positive z hat direction. This net dipole vector encodes all of the processional frequencies. In order to read this vector, we have to get it moving. To do this, the NMR follows a radio wave pulse of energy 90 degrees from the z-hat direction. This energy momentarily orients all dipoles in the same direction and provides enough energy to excite some nuclei into the higher energy down spin state. This tilts the dipole vector into the xy plane. After that pulse, the nuclei dissipate that energy. The nuclei resume precession, and some nuclei that were in the down spin state relax back to the up spin state. The dipole vector will now return to the equilibrium position, pointing in the positive z hat direction. However, the path the vector takes looks like this. This wobbling precession induces a current in a receiver coil, a coil of wire that surrounds the NMR sample. The induced signal that results from this relaxation is called the free induction decay, and it encodes all of the processional frequencies exhibited by the sample. A mathematical technique called the fast Fourier transformation transforms the signal over time graph to a signal over frequency graph. This frequency graph is the NMR spectrum, the output of the NMR spectrometer, and it displays the processional frequencies of nuclei in a sample. Right now, you are seeing the proton NMR spectrum of methanol. This peak occurs due to that fast precessing hydrogen atom that bonds with oxygen. This larger peak occurs due to those three slower precessing hydrogen atoms that bond to carbon. Realize that you can now know for sure that you have methanol because the only peaks present are those corresponding to the four bonds in methanol. You can extend this analysis to any NMR spectrum to identify a compound. Once I connected everything, I, I allowed it to settle. Now knowing the peaks identify and distinguish the bonds in a compound, I now understood NMR and could proceed to work in labs here at MIT, no longer intimidated by the formidable.